The following message was delivered at Westminster Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Bartlesville, Oklahoma on March 10th, 2024. The speaker is Mr. Terry Miller, a ruling elder. The message is based upon 1 Peter 3 verses 1 to 7, and it is titled, Instruction to Wives and Husbands. Please now turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 3 verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you in the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. O Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth would be true, that Christ would be the speaker. Father, I pray that you would use your word to equip us and to teach us this day, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, just as a reminder, and actually the first point today will be somewhat of a recap because it continues into today's message. <clears throat> the occasion that Peter was writing was to the dispersed Jews, these converted Jews who were dispersed in Asia Minor and they were being persecuted by the Roman government. And Peter writes this whole letter, as you remember, as an encouragement to them. As they are being persecuted, Paul gives them wonderful news about the inheritance that lies before us. And he gives us the wonderful news that we have been set free from sin and the bondage to sin in order to be slaves to righteousness. And then he proceeds in a manner of showing how we should live <clears throat> as people who have been set free. And in particular, the last two days, he, or two weeks, <clears throat> he has set forth how we should be subject to the authorities in our lives. <clears throat> God has set forth various authorities in our lives. If you remember, civil authorities, the authority of master over slave, which was common in the day of Peter. <clears throat> and today we will come to another sphere of life or arena of living, <clears throat> the family, the family, husband and wife, and the authority involved in that. We are ultimately under God's authority as James mentioned in Sunday school, what does the clause in the Lord mean when we submit to it in the church membership vow? We acknowledge that all authority is under God. All authority is under God. And even when we submit to the authority of the elders, as Hebrews 13 says, we submit in the Lord, in the Lord, because we acknowledge that the elders have been called and ordained by God and under His authority. Well, God has placed these authorities in our lives for our good and for the good of society. We are most blessed when we, of course, obey His commands, and those commands include obeying those authorities. But Peter acknowledges... <coughs> In a sinful world, that will sometimes involve suffering in order to obey those authorities, as we saw last week. 
and he command or he exhorts us to entrust ourselves to God's care in those cases. He reminds us that we've been set free from sin and we have been set in subjection to various authorities as we live a life of obedience to him. The passages we'll look at today deal with husbands and wives in the family society, the family unit of society and of the church. Peter continues to lay out instructions on how a man and wife should live out their marriage in a life way that is pleasing to God and that does involve subjection just as well. So today we will look at this passage under three heads. One, we are subject to authorities in this life. Two, wives be subject to your husbands. Three, husbands live with your wives in an understanding way. First, we will look at our subjection to authorities because that's what brought us to this passage. John Calvin, who is my go-to guy commentary when I get stumped, says about 1 Peter 2.8, servants be subject to your masters. He has this to say, though this is a particular admonition, yet it is connected with what has gone before, that is being subject to civil authorities, as well as other things which follow, such as subjection of the wife to the husband, for the obedience of servants to masters, and wives to their husband forms a part of civil or social subjection. Calvin says, These things God has given in our society, both our civil and our ecclesiastical spheres of living for our good. Well, about a week ago I had a Columbo experience. Do you remember Lieutenant Columbo, any of you guys? He would always get this suspect, the whodunit guy, and he'd start act playing dumb. And then he would leave the room after questioning him, and he would stop at the door and scratch his head with his cigar in his hand. And he says, well, there's just one thing that still puzzles me. Why did you do this? And then, the, and then he takes out and leaves and leaves the suspect squirming because he, know he knows he's on to him. Well, I don't have any suspects, but I was scratching my head about these passages of subjection. And I had a WWWDD moment. Anyone ever heard of the acronym WWWDD? Well, maybe you've heard of WWJD. This is what would the Westminster Divines do with these passages? Well, last week I showed you part of it. In chapter 20, the Divines developed from Second, from 1 Peter 2, chapter 20. Liberty of conscience. That whole chapter is taken from... First uh, Peter chapter two and other passages, but primarily from First Peter chapter two. And I got looking at this, and I was kind of cogitating on Calvin's comment, and I came to this conclusion that Peter is following the fifth commandment here, the commandment of submission to authority. So I started looking in the Confession of Faith because I like to look at proof texts. I like to look at proof texts. And if I see my text as a proof text to something in the Confession or the Catechisms, I know that they are using these passages. So I looked at the Fifth Commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord gives thee. And then I continued on, who are meant by father and mother in the fifth commandment? We know the fifth commandment is not just limited to children and their parents. By father and mother in the fifth commandment are not only natural parents, but all superiors in age and gifts, and especially such as by God's ordinance, those who are over us in places of authority, whether in the family, church, or commonwealth. 
all those three spheres, God has placed us under authority. And the next, or rather question 126, what is the scope of the fifth commandment? It is the performance of those duties which we mutually owe in our several relations, both to our superiors, our inferiors, and our equals. There is no relationship that does not fall under the fifth commandment unless you can come up with a category different from inferior, superiors, and peers, or equals. And then the question that really got me interested in this is, what is the honor that inferiors owe to their superiors? Because that's what Peter has been talking about. What is that duty that we owe to our authorities? And the answer is the honor which inferiors owe to their superiors is all due reverence in heart, word and behavior, prayer and thanksgiving for them, imitation of their virtues and graces, willing obedience to their lawful commands and counsels. And this next part is where the proof texts of First Peter 2 and 3 come into play. We owe them due submission to their corrections and fidelity unto. For our defense and maintenance of their persons and authority according to their ranks and the nature of their places, bearing with their infirmities, covering them in love, so that they may be a so that they may be an honor to them and their government. So under this question was first Peter two thirteen, obey your civil authorities, obey the civil magistrate, be under subjection to the magistrate. First Peter two eighteen through twenty, slaves obey your masters and be upset in subjection to them, even if they are harsh or treat you unjustly. And then the one we looked at in Sunday school, Hebrews thirteen seventeen, obey those who have rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls regarding our submission to the elders. Well, R.C. Sproul, I always have to get him in one comment on the fifth commandment. This is from his table talk back in 2010. The command to honor one's father and mother carries with it the broader implication to submit to one's employer, government officials, and any other duly instituted authority. For those who cannot honor their fathers and mothers will by no means be able to honor those other leaders that God has established. God has ordered our lives in subjection to these authorities, regardless of what sphere of authority. Well, I also, as I was going through these passages, realized that Paul echoes everything that Peter has to say. And maybe you've recognized that too as we've gone through these passages in First Peter. Peter says, be an objective. Be subject to the Lord's sake for every human institution. Servants, be subject to your masters. And now in 1 Peter 3, 1, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Well, Peter echoes all of this and corroborates it. He starts first with wives and moves in the other direction. Ephesians 5, 22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Ephesians 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And Ephesians 6, 5, bondservants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. So Paul hits those same three spheres of authority over us. And I wanted to give this as the basis because Peter moves into chapter 3 on this wave of verses. Well, the second thing we'll look at today is the text. Wives, be subject to your husbands. Wives, be subject to your husbands. Here, Peter has seven verses considering husbands and wives. It's instructions for husbands and wives. Both are duty-bound to each other as God has set forth in his word. Verse 1 reads, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. So that even if some of them do not obey the word, 
they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. This verse begins with the linkage word likewise. What is Peter likening these verses to that went before it in the context? Well, certainly that we have been set free to be in, in subjection to authority and also that God has by His grace given us the ability to obey our leaders. We are subject, I'm sorry, wives are subject to their husbands. What does that mean? Well, Peter gives one reason for this. And as we look at this, Peter is particularly dealing with wives of unbelieving husbands. Wives of unbelieving husbands, which was very common in Peter's day. Peter, in essence, says, don't beat your husband over the head with scriptures. Don't lay tracks beside his morning breakfast, although those things might be used. But especially win him over by your conduct. By your conduct. Don't try to be a teacher and talk down to your husband. But live in a way that your inner beauty, your inner adornment testifies to God's grace to him. Unbelieving husbands may refrain from listening to the word of God, but they are always aware of their wife's conduct and inner adornment because they live with their wives. God uses that inner beauty and adornment as a testimony of his grace. Well, Peter does not expand on the basis and the reason for the subjection as much as Paul does. And Paul continues to corroborate, which shouldn't surprise us, the thing that Peter says. I would like to look at Paul's writings just a bit. So bear with me with some indulgence on Paul's reason for the subjection of the wife over the husband. Paul says that this is ordered in creation. Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So Paul says, because of this creation ordinance, Wives should submit to their husbands. And marriage, we see, is patterned after the relationship of Christ to his church, his bride. He continues on in 1 Corinthians 11, which we read today. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. We see an order here of headship. The head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of man is Christ. He continues on in chapter 11. Man is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the image and glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So Paul sets forth very clearly from the beginning, God established this order of headship in his word. Woman was created for man and not the other way around. So Paul expresses this headship from the basis of creation. It is grounded in God's word, although it is often ignored today in several spheres of our society, both marriage and in the church and even in our civil society, which I believe also flows according to this headship. But let's return to our text in First Peter 3. 
Verse 3 says, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. It's not the outer adornment, Peter says, but the inner adornment which God uses to attract your husband's attention to you, especially if you have an unbelieving husband. This is your testimony of God's grace to to you. Outer adornment is to take second place to inner adornment. God, uh, Paul, Peter is not saying that a woman shouldn't wear jewelry and shouldn't look attractive and all of those things, but he's saying it should take second place. The primary thing should be the inner adornment. Well, not surprisingly, as we have seen previously today, everything that Peter says, Paul also says. First Timothy 2.9, Likewise, women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but what, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So Paul also is saying it's not the outer adornment, but it is the inner adornment, modesty and self-control and good works. Now Paul sets forth the creation order given to man and woman, even in the sphere of the church. Even in the sphere of the church. It is not just limited to the family. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. You see, uh, Paul says this authority of man and headship over the woman is not just contained in the sphere of the family, but also in the church. When Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority, he's talking about right here from the pulpit, publicly teach and preach and to offer prayer and public worship. Because, what is the reason? Because Adam was formed first, then Eve. That probably rings a bell from what we read before. That is the basis. And then he says to the Corinthian church, as in all churches of the saints, The women should keep silent in churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, what is Paul not saying? He's not saying that women should put duct tape over their mouth during the worship service. He's saying speak publicly, speak publicly and officially in the public worship of God. And when he says that, uh, he does not give the basis, but he has given that basis previously in 1 Timothy 2. So a woman is not permitted to prophesy or pray in public. What does it mean to prophesy? Well, to prophesy is multidimensional, multidimensional. Men who were given the word of God, the prophets of old spoke forth the word of God about things that were to come. But in the pulpit, when we prophesy, we bring forth God's word to the people. Prophesy is the proclamation of the word of God. And that's what Peter and Paul are talking about here and praying in public. 1 Corinthians 11, which we read, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covers dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors 
her head. Well, we talked about the heads earlier in passages that Paul wrote, that man is the head of the woman and Christ is the head of man. What is this saying here? It's not speaking, as we might think, as a proof text that women should wear head coverings. It's not saying that. Um, But Paul deals with that later in the verse, and we won't get into that. But every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Well, how does a wife dishonor her head if she prophesies publicly and prays publicly and worship? Because she is imitating the instructions that were given solely to man. Wife is not to pray or prophesy in the first place regardless of where, whether she keeps her head covered or not. And both Calvin and Charles Hodge say in this, well, this is a quote from Calvin, prophesy I take here to mean declaring the mystery of God for the edification of the hearers as I take in 1 Corinthians 14. And for prayer, meaning Preparing a form of prayer and taking the lead of prayer for all the people, which is part of the public teacher. For Paul is not arguing here as to every kind of prayer, but as to solemn prayer in public, in the public worship of God's people. For we must not be so scrupulous as to look upon it as a criminal thing for the man teacher to have a cap on his head and not take it off, Paul says. And this, you've been to public events when the invocation is given. Uh, Men are uh, told to remove their head covering for the invocation. And it comes from this text. But Paul means nothing more than this, that it should appear that the man has authority and that the woman is under subjection And this is secured when the man uncovers his head in view of the church, though he should afterwards put his cap on again from fear of catching cold. I don't know if Calvin had a light moment there or he was dealing with someone there who he was teasing or admonishing. But this... This verse that I read is just instruction for the man and and he is saying and a woman should not prophesy or prayer offer prayer in, in public and as I said both Calvin and Charles Hodge agree that that is the reason for this verse is talking about proclaiming God's word publicly in worship and praying publicly in worship they are instructed to remove their head coverings before they do it. That is, the men. So therefore, I have not worn my head covering today. I agree with Calvin and Hodge, not to be confused with Calvin and Hobbes, in this matter. Well, God has set forth this order between men and women in the worship of His church, just as He has in marriage This is brought into the sphere of the church. Well, let's return to our text again. In 1 Peter 3, verse 3, instruction to the wife, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in which in God's sight is very precious. And he goes on in verse 5 to say, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Well, Paul sets forth Sarah as an example, Abraham's wife and his half-sister, if it must be known. 
as an example of properly adorning herself with these hidden qualities of a gentle and quiet spirit. So he commends her as an example of a submissive wife. She called her husband master or lord, giving respect to him. Now that's a cultural thing. We don't, in this, in our culture today and society, the wife doesn't show respect by calling her husband master or lord. But Paul is just saying that she was respectful of him. Wives are to be respectful of their husbands before their children in the family and before those outside the family. She is. And the husband, as we will see later, is to esteem his wife in the family to the children and to those who are outside the family. Both have duties to one another, but we will get to that in a bit later. But Sarah did acknowledge Abraham's headship over her, and he exhorts women to walk in the path of Sarah and be Sarah's daughters. Some people erroneously think that a woman should submit blindly to everything the husband requests from her, even if he is using or abusing her. But this situation is no different than the other situations we have looked at because we have seen that we are to submit in the Lord. And the Lord, again, acknowledges the Lord's authority over all things. Every authority that God has ordained, whether it be civil, ecclesiastical, or the husband in the family, is subject to God. And the person who is under authority submits in the Lord. They cannot do anything that's sinful. They must refuse. So if a husband ask the wife to do something sinful, she must refuse. The law also protects us against tyranny. Against tyranny. It protects a woman from the tyranny of her husband. If her husband is abusive, whether that be physical or emotionally abusive, a woman is not without recourse. She can go to her session and find help there. And ultimately, if her husband does not repent, then she is freed from that relationship of marriage because her husband has disobeyed his marriage vows and has basically abandoned his wife. Well, now we will look at the husband's. Point number three, husbands live with your wives in an understanding way. Now it's time for you husbands to squirm on the pew. You're on the hot seat. What does God require of husbands? Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Well, the women have six verses given to them. The men have one here. But if we look at Peter's address to husbands and wives, it's the other way around. There's more given to the men than women. So we shouldn't say that wives have more of a duty to their husbands than husbands have to their wives. Both are to love one another, and live in their various roles according to what Peter has set forth here. Both are equally responsible to obey God in relationship to their spouse. The wife is called to be submissive. The husband is called to honor his wife. And Peter here in verse 7 says that honor requires a considerable understanding of her a considerable understanding of her. The husband is to understand his wife. He is to live with his wife according to his knowledge of her. This is not entirely, but considerably concerned with sexual intimacy. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. Paul says, 
in 1 Corinthians 7. The husband is to honor his wife as a weaker vessel. What do we mean by this? The husband is to honor his wife as a weaker vessel. Well, he's not to be a drill sergeant or to lord his authority over her. Um, Ed Clowney has this to say. A husband is to season his authority over his wife with tenderness and respect to her. He is to know her, his wife's needs and recognize the delicacy of her nature and feelings. Wives, women are different from men. Women are different from men. And uh, if you have been married for a long time, maybe you figured that out by now. I don't know. I'm not sure I have totally. I haven't totally figured out how to understand my wife, but I've gained some ground perhaps. We are to recognize her delicacy and her feelings. Delicacy of nature and feelings. But the husband is also to honor his wife, Peter says, as fellow heirs of life. What does this mean? Fellow heirs of life. Whether this is talking about heirs of life as an inheritance in children or heirs to life to the inheritance that Peter mentions in chapter 1. I don't know. It could be either. But probably is the latter talking about spiritual heirs of life. They are equals as spiritual heirs heirs of life. Well, marriage is a relationship that God has designed, as we said earlier, as a picture and pattern of Christ and his church, Christ's love for his church, and the man is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. Again, we go to Paul. Paul seems to have more to say than Peter on this matter. Ephesians 5, 31, Paul says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Marriage is pattern after the relationship of Christ and his church. Paul goes on to say, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Men, do any of you love your own bodies? Peter's saying that you do. You do. And remember the second table of the law and its summary? We are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. If we are to fully understand how much we love ourselves, we will see what a monumental task it is to love others as much as we love ourselves. Well, I was listening to uh, Jay Adams. He was in Tulsa doing a marriage seminar probably 30 years ago at a church there. And he is the example of a man putting his arm through a door or a window or something and cutting himself. And he says... See this? See what happened? to See this? You want to see my wound? <laughs> he was showing the example that man truly does love his own body and cherishes it. As Paul says in Ephesians 5.29, no one ever hated his flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. So we... Gentlemen, are to love our wives and cherish them as Christ loves and cherishes the church. This is an impossible task to accomplish, but it is our goal, and we should be making progress in it. Well, Peter ends by saying, do not deprive... I'm sorry. Peter ends by saying that if a husband does not honor his wife, their joint prayers might be hindered. They will lose their effectiveness, Peter says. And Paul 
salutes that and says, Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. The husband and wife in the home should be a temple of priests offering sacrifices to God as we saw in earlier weeks. Husbands are just as tied to their duties as wives are tied to her duties to the husband. A husband should not use his authority as a pretense to neglect his duty for the wife. And he should not conduct his authority with fluctuating passions. Fluctuating passions. He is to esteem the virtues he sees in his wife. And Peter says, if he ignores his duty, their prayers will be hindered. Well, it is also true that the wife is to obey her duty regarding her husband because that also affects the mutual and joint prayers of the couple. Sin in any relationship strains that relationship and it blocks the fellowship of that relationship between God and themselves. God and themselves. But the husband is responsible not only for the relationship of God and the spiritual growth of his entire family, but as with his wife as well. Well, in closing, what more can be said than has already been said? Wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by your conduct. And that is true for wives who have believing husbands or unbelieving husbands. Husbands, love your wives and live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to her and esteeming her. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have given to us a pattern in marriage, a pattern in a picture of Christ and his church for us so that we may see how we should live as husband and wife. Father, we pray that you would forgive us for we often fail so far short of what is commanded here for both husband and wife. But we pray that you would teach us from your word. We pray that your spirit would indwell us and enable us more and more to maintain these difficult duties between husband and wives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For more sermons like the one you just heard, visit westminsterbartlesville.org or join us at 9.30 in the morning and 5 o'clock in the evening every Lord's Day. We're located on the corner of Adams and Chickasaw in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. We'd be happy to have you.